the purge from within. The long and the short of it is, if I lose in November, I don't know that it's safe for me to stay in this state. I mean, that's, it's, I don't know how else to say it more plainly than that. I'm running against a guy who has the endorsement of the Republican Party in Michigan, uh, who has made as part of his platform uh, wanting to imprison me, the Secretary of State, and the governor of Michigan. I'm Todd Zwillick, and this is Breaking the Vote, our series where we track the growing assault on voting rights and efforts to undermine democracy in America. We spend time on this show telling you how the rising agents of Trumpist authoritarianism attack their enemies to gain power. Pick them, migrants, scientists, the press, even Disney, and naturally, Democrats. But if you wanna be in the authoritarian business, none of those enemies scares you like the enemy within. All the best dictators know, before you crush your opposition, you first crush your dissenters. Now here, that means Republicans who aren't sufficiently down with the pro-coup, pro-conspiracy, contemporary GOP. They call them rhinos, Republicans in name only. Join the MAGA crew, get a rhino hunting permit. There's no bagging limit, no tagging limit, and it doesn't expire until we save our country. You can already think of some of the Republicans, really conservative ones, who are out in this GOP. Their crime? Defending democratic norms, refusing to support the lie, and most egregious, refusing to support the leader. All across America, you can find the purge victims, like this guy, the conservative speaker of the Arizona House, who is now on his way out for refusing to help Trump's lieutenants steal an election. But then he committed the ultimate crime, he told the truth under oath. But what does a purge accomplish aside from casting out the traitors? Well, take a look at some of the people who strive to survive and stay on the leader's good side. This guy, House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy, told everyone Trump was responsible for the insurrection. He told his colleagues he'd urged the big man to resign the presidency. But it only took a few weeks for that guy to become this guy, kissing the ring at Mar-a-Lago. And it took another year for that guy to lead the cover-up and refuse to tell the January 6th committee what he knows about the worst attack on democracy since the Civil War. Now that's loyalty. Today we'll talk to one Republican who survived a Trumpist attempt to purge him from his job, investigating deaths as a county coroner. Plus, the Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris, sits down with Liz Landers to talk about threats to the country's democratic institutions and how people are being used to score political points. And we look at how that purging from within is right from the playbook of some of the most dangerous authoritarian movements in history. But first, Vice's Ben McCoo takes us to Michigan as he reports on growing extremism in America and those looking to stop it, including the state's AG. Your office has taken on domestic terrorism and extremism in a serious way. Obviously, you have the kidnapping and assassination plot of Governor Whitmer uh, and the base. Do you think that this is a broadly a major problem across the U.S. right now? Absolutely. I mean, there's no question about it. Um, I don't think in my lifetime I've ever seen anything like this. And obviously, you know, I was around, I was a prosecutor during the Timothy McVeigh Oklahoma City bombing. And that brought to our attention domestic terrorism in a pretty major way. But I think the difference then is that there was bipartisan consensus on tackling the problem. And so you had Republicans and Democrats who came together in order to use the full force of their offices, especially at the federal level, to really combat domestic terrorism. Now you have a division between the parties and, and you have one party that still wants to aggressively uh, combat domestic terrorism and you have another party that seemingly condones it, might even support it. You're up for re-election in November. But this is a big, you know, this election is gonna be pretty impactful, especially on President Biden and what happens going forth in the next couple of years. Obviously, the last few years has also brought a lot of political problems, I'd say, in this country surrounding elections, uh, January 6th. Are you at all worried about what could happen, not just in Michigan for this election coming up, but also across the country? 
are you afraid of some political violence? I am concerned enough that we are, you know, taking every measure that we can possibly think of to ensure that people have the ability to vote safely. What we didn't prepare for was what we saw at the counting boards, particularly at TCF Center. Did I think that the chair of the Republican Party would put out an alert for everybody to come down there and harass the poll workers? No, I didn't see that coming, but we'll be prepared next time for it. I see Republicans out there that, you know, seemingly they don't want to condemn domestic terrorism. They don't want to condemn groups like the Proud Boys or the Three Percenters or any of those organizations because they're seen as their supporters at this point. And obviously, we're very familiar with how Donald Trump treated these groups. That's well, who would you like me to condemn? White Proud Boys. Boys. That's right. Proud, Proud Boys. Boys. Stand back and stand by. He treated them as allies, not as criminals. So until we get to a point where both parties will stand up, loudly condemn this type of behavior, this kind of conduct, these sorts of organizations, and work together to make sure that these individuals and these groups are no longer a threat to society, I think we'll continue to see a problem. Are you at all worried that, you know, should there be a sweeping red wave come November that, you know, next year there's going to be a lot more politically minded prosecutions against people going after them for instituting laws that, go, that goes against right wing extremism? Do you think there's some fear around that? I'm running against a guy who has the endorsement of the Republican Party in Michigan, who has made as part of his platform wanting to imprison me, the Secretary of State, and the governor of Michigan. He has said it repeatedly that that is his plan. So does that concern me? Yeah, kinda. I mean, the long and the short of it is, if I lose in November, you know, I don't know that it's safe for me to stay in this say, state. I mean, that's, it's, I don't know how else to say it more plainly than that. Ben, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. If I lose this election, I don't think it's safe for me to stay here, Dana Nessel says. That sounds crazy. I mean, based on what you saw in Michigan, is that a, a, a credible concern? I think it absolutely is a credible concern. In fact, when I, when people mention that as being crazy, that a, an elected official now is fearing for their lives, if you look at what's going on with the far right right now, they're targeting judges, they're targeting elected officials. So when you're looking at something like this with the attorney general, her saying that, I, I can, she's getting daily death threats. So for her, I, I think it's very real. Michigan, I mean, has a long and rich history of militia movements and extremism, right? I mean, this, this isn't new for them. No, it's not. I mean, if you remember, this, it goes way further back than this. There was obviously a massive Klan presence for a very long time. But also, if you look at the 90s, there was something called the Michigan Militia that hasn't gone away. And someone named Timothy McVeigh, who is you know, the, the, the arch conspirator of the Oklahoma City bombing, actually spent some time in Michigan before that. So this is something that goes back a long time. And the reason that I was there was to look at this group called The Base, which has a huge presence, or had a huge presence in Michigan and a very active cell. And the FBI and the Michigan State Police went out and took it down. And they had a compound in northern Michigan that they were fortifying. And you know, for that to happen, it means you have to have some support within the state and grounds to, to create something like that. So Dana Nessel is in a race for attorney general re-election campaign. Her opponent is a guy called Matthew DiPerno. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about him a little bit? Because he's not your average Republican candidate, although maybe now he is, but, but he's very Michigan in this sense. Yeah, he's a, he's a Michigan lawyer, and he's also you know very Trump-endorsed candidate. He's very MAGA, but he's also someone that met with the Trump administration on the lead up to January 6th. So the, the, the guys that you meet, mostly guys, I assume, in the, and the groups that you've covered in Michigan, like how do they respond? How do they feel when they hear messages from the top, like, if I'm indicted, very bad things will happen, or Proud Boys stand back and stand by? How does that kind of thing arrive at them, and how do they respond? Well, I think this is very much the moment for not only sort of the broader militia movement, not only in, in Michigan, but in in the country to sort of heed that call that political violence is not only tolerated, but it's something that is endorsed by the mainstream Republican Party. Did you know that a governor can declare war? Governor can declare war, okay? And we, we're gonna probably 
We're going to probably see that. So I think to them also, their political world and their political reality is that the, the election was stolen in, in, in 2020. So their faith in these systems is very low. So to them, the next move is to engage in violence if someone like Trump isn't elected again or a candidate like him. So I think it's landing on very, very welcomed ears, to put it lightly. I got to say, I mean, I'm glad you're here. Very glad you're here, Mm -hmm. Ben. But you cover terrorism and extremism Mm -hmm. for Vice. We're a political show. (laughs) I mean, I'm I'm glad you're here, but it's weird. Yeah, we're even doing this. I, I, I agree completely. I have to tell you, I did not expect to be on a political news show. But now I think what you're seeing is this very much this marriage between extremist ideologies that you'd find in you know, fringe right-wing terrorist organizations bleeding into the mainstream GOP in a way that, you know, I think any terrorism extremist reporter in the last five or six years really didn't see becoming the norm. So in our previous episode about political extremism, we had an expert who explicitly warned that a catastrophic event like Oklahoma City Mm -hmm. is very possible given all the ingredients in this current environment. Do you see evidence in your reporting? Do you see things in Michigan that, that give that credence? Uh, I've seen things in Michigan, it doesn't take, it's it's a Google search away. But if you look even more broadly, you've seen mass shootings foiled by the FBI, you've seen assassinations foiled by the FBI. There's a lot of stuff out there that's very akin to this. You know, the war on terror turned out a lot of veterans and you have a lot of veterans who have joined these extremist groups who understand how to use weapons and explosives and things like this. Someone like Timothy McVeigh was a Gulf War veteran. And I think something like that happening again, as much as I don't want to say it's going to happen, it, 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 it's truly a possibility. And I know this is something that FBI counterterrorism investigators that I'm, I'm in communication with are truly worried about. You know, when you look at something like neo-Nazism and extreme violent rhetoric coming from it, I mean, I would imagine that the Repu- Republican Party does not want to align itself to something like that. But they're very clearly saying, stop looking at things like that. Now, if they're saying that's their votership, that's a problem. And I think you know, when you consider just how destructive these types of politics can be and how, how much bloodshed can come from them, I, it, it's astounding that the GOP is even weaponizing this in the slightest. We reached out to Dana Nessel's Republican opponent, Matthew DiPerno, to ask him to come on the program. We haven't heard back. Coming up, Steve Bannon could face months behind bars for contempt of Congress, but that's just one of the problems he's facing. We go back in time to see why a privately funded border wall made from hemp concrete could be what makes Bannon find out just how far his alleged grifting can go. Grift, it really pays until it doesn't. And you gotta start paying legal bills. Steve Bannon might be learning that lesson as he faces potential prison time if he's convicted of money laundering, conspiracy, and fraud. Prosecutors say it happened while he served on the board of advisors for the We Build the Wall campaign, a highly lucrative gambit to raise private money to build part of the border wall. You remember that, right? In the waning hours of the Trump administration, Trump pardoned Bannon federally. But in September, prosecutors in Manhattan indicted him, with Bannon pleading not guilty. A Manhattan judge set the trial date for late 2023. By then, we might forget how bizarre this scheme really was and how Bannon kind of screwed over a triple amputee Iraq war vet named Brian Colfage in the process. More on that in a minute. I covered the We Build the Wall campaign in 2019 in part because they were planning to build their wall out of hemp concrete, which was weird enough to get me on a plane. So I traveled to Tucson to attend an informational meeting at a retirement community. And, well, a little something Bannon said to me ended up in both the federal and New York indictments. I did this kind of as a volunteer. I do think it's, I don't think it's a stunt. It's clearly to augment Mm -hmm. the government. I mean, are you gonna raise, uh, you know, $2 billion to actually uh, complete uh, the the physical barrier? I think the answer to that is probably no. Hmm, kind of a volunteer. Prosecutors argue that while Bannon insisted publicly that he wasn't getting any money from this, he in fact was, and he was spreading the wealth. But let's back up a little bit. This whole thing began when Brian Colfage, the Iraq war vet, got fed up with a looming government shutdown and started a GoFundMe page. If Washington couldn't get their shit together to build the border wall, maybe concerned citizens could do it on their own. Boy oh boy, it went viral. 
thousands of small donations rolled in, amounting to anywhere from 15 to $25 million. But there was a problem. They hoped to just hand over the money to the federal government and they'd build the wall. But when Bannon got involved, he pointed out that you can't just give money to the government and earmark it for what you want. We build the wall would have to build it themselves and manage that money themselves. Here's how Bannon described it to me. So I made the recommendation. What I think you ought to do is think about if people really want to have, be activists and get engaged, go to GoFundMe and see if you can't flip it to actually build the wall. And then you guys have a C4 and actually get people that know what they're doing. When Bannon says C4, he's referring to a 501c4, a kind of nonprofit organization that engages in political activity and has rather opaque reporting rules. Don't give the money to the government, give the money to someone who could guss up a 501c4. Like who, I wonder? I've got a pretty good C4 of that. You know, we did a lot of stuff for the, for the midterms. I don't think people focus in the House enough, but we made a film and went out to 35 districts and really put a lot of money to work. That 501c4 is called Citizens of the American Republic, and Bannon is the principal officer and president of the group. Well, both federal and New York prosecutors argue that over a million dollars from the wall campaign was routed through numerous financial entities like Citizens of the American Republic, and they, crucially, paid Colfage what amounts to a salary. And that's where the alleged fraud really hits the fan. In the bylaws of the We Build the Wall organization and in promotional material, they straight up say that Colfage would take no salary from the endeavor. It was a selling point. 100% of the money goes right to the wall. And yet, according to the indictment, hundreds of thousands of dollars went to Colfage. Here's what Colfage had to say to me that day. Is there a way that, like, how do people hold you guys accountable for the money that you're giving well, them? We, we have an audit committee and mm -hmm. internal and external committee who, you know, will be over our finances, and so we're public with, we'll be public with everything that we do. Well, not exactly. According to the indictment, a couple days after we spoke, Bannon okayed $100,000 to be transferred to Colfage, and through the year, he received over $250,000. Now, to be charitable, maybe Colfage should have gotten some money from this winning idea. He was able to convince people to give him money, and maybe Bannon's intent here was to reward a war hero. But you know, you gotta tell people that's what you're doing. For his part, Colfage pled guilty to federal charges of wire fraud and faces years in prison. According to the DOJ, he used funds to buy a boat, a fancy SUV, jewelry, and some other stuff. Whether Bannon will be convicted and go to prison remains to be seen, and we'll be paying close attention. But in the meantime, there's a lesson buried in here. If you have a great MAGA grassroots idea and the dollars start pouring in, maybe don't involve Steve Bannon. That piece of advice might just keep you out of prison. After the break, Liz Lander sits down for an exclusive interview with the vice president, Kamala Harris, to talk about the very real lives being used as political pawns in the immigration fight, the sustained attacks against American democracy, and a lot more. They're playing games. These are political stunts with real human beings. Do you feel that this is an emergency situation for this country? I feel it is a critical situation, no doubt. Democracy is very fragile. It's gonna only be as strong as our willingness to defend it and fight for it. Inhumane is how Vice President Kamala Harris is describing the actions of GOP governors like Ron DeSantis and Greg Abbott as they ship migrants out of their states and into jurisdictions run by their political rivals. In an interview with Vice's Liz Landers, the VP is laying blame for the immigration crisis on the Trump administration, even though she is the Biden administration's point person at the border. And she's pointing the finger at Trump and his supporters for the backsliding of American democracy itself. Here's that interview. There are a lot of election deniers who are running for real positions of authority across this country. What if they win? I am aware of at least 11 states that have Secretary of State candidates who are election deniers. So the very people who want to run elections don't trust elections. That represents a potential breakdown of one of the most important systems 
in our democracy, which is our election systems. And I urge everyone who is in those 11 states to pay attention because there are certain rights that you have and your parents have and your grandparents before them assumed will be intact, including the right to vote for who you want and to know your vote counts. And election deniers are suggesting that those votes don't count. Do you think that this sort of rolling back of reproductive rights in this country is a signal that democracy is backsliding here? So I have, as vice president, met with and talked directly with, by phone or in person, 100 world leaders, presidents, prime ministers, chancellors, kings. And one of the strengths of who we are as America is we can walk in those rooms, chin up, shoulders back, talking about what it means to be a democracy founded on fundamental principles, grounded in the concept of freedom and liberty, justice, equality. And so we walk in those rooms then, and we talk with other countries about the importance of human rights, about rule of law, and it gives us the authority to do that. Well, with that role, as a role model, comes the fact that people watch everything you do to see if it matches up to what you say. And countries around the world are now watching that our highest court took a constitutional right from the people of our country. They're looking at the fact that we have a tax on voting rights. I do believe that it challenges the strength of our ability to fight for democracies around the world when we have fundamental rights that are being attacked by extremist so-called leaders within our own country. I do believe it has an impact, not to mention another residual impact is potentially that autocratic countries, autocratic regimes, regimes can then say, hey, you wanna talk about, we need to be a democracy, you point to the US. Well, look, they just took this right from women. We can too. Are we? losing our democracy right now? Are we in an emergency? I, I hear that from people around this country. I'm sure you've heard that from folks too. There are a lot of people who really think we are on the verge of moving towards a completely different form of government. There is great strength in democracy, in a democracy, because it's about protecting individual rights, protecting freedom, fighting for equality and justice. That's the strength of democracy. The other side of it is democracy is very fragile. It's gonna only be as strong as our willingness to defend it and fight for it. And so I say, we all have not just a, a, a responsibility, we have a duty to fight for it. Do you feel that this is an emergency situation for this country? I feel it is a critical situation, no doubt. And yeah, when you look at what, what's happened, for example, again, on the issue of Dobbs, the Dobbs decision has created a healthcare crisis in America on this issue of access to reproductive health. A crisis, crises are emergencies, yeah. There was a bus of migrants that was dropped off in front of your home. Also, Governor DeSantis flew migrants from Texas to Martha's Vineyard. Can you understand the political point that DeSantis and Abbott are trying to make here? They're playing games. These are political stunts with real human beings who are fleeing harm. I mean, do you know what's happening in Venezuela right now? There were children, people being put on a bus or a plane um, who don't know where they're going or where they were being sent. Human beings, real people who have fled harm who came to the United States of America seeking refuge, asylum. I think it is the height of irresponsibility, much less, frankly, a dereliction of duty when you are an elected leader to play those kinds of games with human life and human beings. If you, want, if you think there is a problem, be part of the solution. What is that solution? Can you understand the frustration, though, that Americans have about the situation at the border? It's not a monolith. There are, very, there, there are a variety of components to this. One 
is the fact that under the previous administration, they decimated a system that was designed to address immigration. And so we have been spending in the last 18 months we've been in office, spending a, an incredible amount of time and work and resources to reconstruct that system. The first piece of legislation that we offered back in January of last year was for a pathway for citizenship. People are playing political games with that and it's going nowhere. We're looking at the cause. Why do people leave home? Most people don't want to leave home. Most people do not want to leave their grandmother. They don't want to leave the place where they grew up. They don't want to leave the language they speak. They don't want to leave the place where they go to pray. And when they do, it's usually for one of two reasons, because they are fleeing harm or because they simply cannot address their basic needs or the needs of their family to stay. Okay, so part of what we have to do to address the issue is also deal with that piece of it. I'm in charge, for example, of, of, of coordinating a what we call a root causes strategy. What are the causes of people leaving? Um, we have now raised $3.2 billion to help the folks in those countries stay by giving them opportunities for them to take care of themselves in their home country, which is frankly what they want to be able to do. So there are many facets to this, but you know, doing it for the sake of a headline, what we're seeing with these governors is, is irresponsible and it's, it's inhumane, it's inhumane. Those who have power often refuse to give it up and those who want it will do whatever it takes to get it. That's why the founders did a constitution but with Italy electing its first far-right leader since Mussolini, we have to ask, does the world have a strongman problem? Up next, we speak with one vice correspondent who's reported around the world seeing that fight for power take shape. Hind Hassan joins me after this. The world's strongmen actually like to do things by the book. Mussolini, Vladimir Putin, right up to Donald Trump. It's simple enough. Promise law and order, normalize law breaking, use propaganda to empower your supporters, and silence the dissenters. The pattern is repeating all over the world, but can American democracy peel itself away from its own problems long enough to notice and to do something about it? I spoke to Vice News correspondent Hind Hassan about the mold of the strongman and how her reporting lays bare the return of authoritarian rule around the world. Hind Hassan, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. Uh, you've covered the Taliban. You've seen Putin's war in Ukraine up close. Uh, you've covered uprisings in Egypt. And it makes me want to ask you if there's a pattern that you've noticed with authoritarian regimes or the advancement of authoritarianism, things that we should be on the lookout for here in our own country. What I'd say is that over the past eight years, there has definitely been world events, international events that have taken place that have either contributed to a rise in authoritarianism or perhaps allowed it to evolve in a certain way. So for example, in 2014, you had uh, what was known as the refugee crisis and the rise in populism and a lot of politicians who used anti-refugee and anti-immigration rhetoric to try and win votes. And that resulted in um, a lot of far-right parties gaining power or at least consolidating power or becoming more prominent. That happens in places like Hungary, France, Germany. And then in uh, 2016, you had the election of Donald Trump in the United States, a man who very openly was fine with expressing his disdain for certain democratic rules, a man who very often used the term fake news to undermine anybody who tried to hold him accountable. Now, in the different places that I've been to around the world, I can't tell you the amount of times that you hear somebody saying fake news and it's almost always a politician saying it to you because they've heard it and they know that they can try and undermine anyone who attacks what they're doing or who tries to highlight injustices by saying the term fake news. And then you have, in 2020, coronavirus. And what happened with the pandemic was 
a lot of countries, many countries, democratic or under dictatorships, uh, limited freedoms, but they did it with the consent of the public. But human rights organizations have shown through their research that there are a number of countries, many countries, and I'm not just talking about dictatorships, I'm talking about places like the United States of America, places like the United Kingdom as well, where certain governments or institutions have used coronavirus to either try and extend their powers, consolidate their powers, or crack down on the opposition. I would say that the US, rather than what's happening, the US reflecting on that and how it impacts them, I'd say that America is right bang in the middle of it because we know that dictatorships can struggle to continue without the backing of the United States of America. So for example, we went to Egypt to report on how Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, who presides over a regime that disappears people who speak out, that tortures them, that kills them, he receives billions of dollars of funding or his regime receives billions of dollars of funding in military aid from the United States. And we had Joe Biden come in, president of the United States of America, and say that human rights is going to be at the center of their government, but he's still signing those checks. And we've got places like Saudi Arabia, which we know as well has committed considerable human rights abuses inside Saudi Arabia. Also, we know that they killed Jamal Khashoggi brutally, and that officials were involved in that. Now you have Joe Biden fist bumping him recently. An American Palestinian journalist, Shreena Ba'akle, was killed by Israeli military, and yet the US has failed to condemn Israeli authorities for their response to that and for their responsibility in that. And so what happens in the world in terms of authoritarianism, what happens in the United States, it goes hand in hand. It's, to me, um, it, it is part of the same system. We used to export our democracy or the idea of it. We told ourselves we did. Is the democratic export of the United States fundamentally changed in places like this, do you think? I think a lot of people would disagree with the idea that the United States was ever, um, was ever spreading democracy to other countries. And you just have to look at Iraq and what happens in Iraq uh, in 2003. So how do you go into a country allegedly because you want to bring in democracy and yet not have a blueprint for post-war. And you have a situation now where in Iraq, um, corruption is incredibly high. Uh, people don't have faith in the democratic system. That's not to say that the United States is responsible for everything that happens in Iraq, but that is to say that this nation building or spreading democracy I don't think there's many people outside of the United States of America who buy into that. Why is the United States allegedly exporting democracy in one country and yet propping up dictatorships in the other country? Why is the United States completely fine with Saudi Arabia arresting women for driving, not, let's say not completely fine, but turns a blind eye to women being arrested for driving? This is before it was made legal. It's now uh, legal for women to drive in Saudi Arabia or arresting people who speak out or dissidents or in Egypt, for example, or in different parts of the world, but then take specific interest in de exporting democracy to Iraq. That's not to say that countries can occasionally carry out acts that do help nations and do save lives. That can happen. Um, you know, supporting, you know, troops fighting ISIS, for example, uh, has definitely had an impact. But the reality is that that perhaps for a lot of people is they are realizing that there was never really a true desire to export democracy and it was more about self-interest. Hint Hassan, thanks for joining us. Thank you. This is Breaking the Vote. I'm Todd Zwillick. Say you're a would-be dictator trying to root out the dissenters in your party. How do you know when the purge is complete? Well, one way to tell is by who's left behind. Last month, there was a vote in Congress to reform the law that Donald Trump tried to exploit on January 6th. The idea was to prevent a repeat of that particular coup attempt. Here are the nine Republicans who voted for it. Know what they all have in common? Not one is returning to Congress next year. One way or another, they've all 
been cleansed from the GOP. And exactly zero Republicans vying to be in the House next year voted yes. Who's left? The ones who get it. When you serve a would-be strongman, you protect the leader against the law and against democracy so that you're not the next rhino to get hunted. I spoke to one survivor of a purge, a local official who was able to fend off a primary opponent who was against facts and expertise, traits you'd think you would want when you're running for the county coroner's office. I talked to him about his race, why he says that voters in his district in Colorado still seem to care about qualifications for public office. But for how much longer? Dr. Leon Kelly, El Paso County, Colorado, thanks for joining. Thank you. So Dr. Kelly, let's just do your resume for one second here. You're a board certified forensic pathologist, right? That's correct. And county coroner is an elected job there in El Paso County, right? Yeah, in El Paso County, Colorado, um, the, the coroner, the person who's in charge of investigating deaths, is an elected position. Uh, describe what happened in your primary over the summer. Yeah, so, you know, because it's a coroner system and it's elected, um, everybody who runs for coroner has to uh, make their way through the normal political process. Uh, in this case, it was a Republican primary. In my Republican primary, I had an opponent who was essentially a COVID denier, um, kind of big lie conspiracy theorist who ran against me with no significant qualifications. Fortunately, in our primary, um, the El Paso County voters, Republican and unaffiliated voters, felt that the actual qualifications to do the job was the single most important thing, and that uh, and that's who they voted for. That was me. Now, how would you describe though the overall political climate in the county? Let's say you know over the last two years. Yeah, I mean, El Paso County historically has been one of the more Republican counties in the entire country. Um, and I've lived here for more than 15 years. But the environment certainly has changed over the last couple of years. The Republican Party, as it used to stand in this county, which was sort of pro-business, small government, you know, small business owners, um, pro-military, that, that party is not really here. That's not who's in leadership in the, the official party. It's much more that far right wing sort of Trumpism kind of strain of Republican Party that doesn't really have a lot to do with the traditional sort of values and principles of the party. It's much more devoted to an individual and devoted to, you know, sort of their ideology, their sort of strain of, of conservatism. And it's a much more in your face, much more aggressive, kind of threatening. You know, I think their goal in many ways is to make life as miserable as possible for um, what used to be the Republican Party. How do they make life miserable for you, for other candidates, Republican candidates who are on the slate? Yeah, so it's it's a lot of accusations. You know, they accuse me of uh, being a puppet for the CDC and being part of the establishment, which they call anybody who's kind of competent and sane, uh, you know, a... Um, you know, a, a rhino, um, general things like that. A lot of uh, sort of wasteful open records requests, trying to waste time, um, very aggressive, threatening, lots of accusations. Um, you know, receive letters to your home. You have people show up at the office angry, uh, threatening, just sort of general obnoxious and sort of toxic behavior. I think in many ways, the goal of some of these individuals is to make the political process as sort of as toxic and as uncomfortable um, as possible to drive out those folks who would disagree with them or would stand up to them, honestly. They, they know by making it as miserable as possible, they can eliminate sort of the, the moderates in the party and the moderates in the community. And then that's all that's left at the end is kind of this, this hardcore group of far right wing individuals. Now, I just wanna say, I mean, running for Senate or congressperson, all kinds of people run for those jobs. You're in a job where I mean, true expertise really matters. You spent some time with Vice's Liz Landers, and it was pretty clear from your time together that you're dealing with some really heavy stuff. I mean, investigating suicides, drug overdoses. I think you said at one point that you're dealing with cases, every single one of them is the worst day in somebody's life. I mean, really a job where, where qualification and seriousness of purpose really matters, and yet people who are holding conspiracy theories and sort of attacking outside ideologies are coming for you. No, that's exactly right. I mean, this job isn't a political position. It's certainly a public position, but, you know, your, your, if your feelings, your personal feelings about, you know, your politics are 
infiltrating how you treat families who've suffered this unimaginable tragedy are somehow swaying your decisions on cause and manner of death, you're the wrong person for this job. And historically, that well, was that's what I ran on was that this isn't a political position. It should make no difference what party I'm running for. When something horrible happens to you or somebody you love, you want the person showing up to be the highest qualified you know, person. Um, you know, If you're having a heart attack, you want the best cardiologist. You don't care what the cardiologist's op- opinion is on a lot of these sort of cultural war, you know, political issues. But that was the opposite of what this group ran on. They ran on, we want everything to be as hyper-partisan as possible, even the coroner, right? Even the coroner has to be someone who has sworn allegiance to, to our ideology. And the truth was, I think, my opponent and the people who supported her never really even grasped or cared what the coroner actually did. It made no difference to them. That wasn't the point. The point was is that it's the coroner was one more platform, one more opportunity to spout and to carry that flag for what they believe is the reality. Um, and without care of the consequences, within you know a month or so of me winning my um, primary, we had an officer who was killed in the line of duty. Um, and I, I, I shudder to think, and other people have come up to me since then and said, good God, what would have happened had this individual who knew nothing about it, who couldn't care less about it, um, would be in charge when something like that happens? What happens if that person is in charge when there's a mass shooting or um, when another horrible tragedy, which is inevitable in the world that we live in, happens? Um, what would that do to the community? How would how would we suffer? And the ramifications are, they're scary. When you think about this is one community and this is happening all over, all over the country. Still, Dr. Kelly, I mean, on the one hand, you're just a county coroner and a physician who's trying to do physician stuff and do your job. On the other hand, uh, you're a Republican with expertise who face down conspiratorial Trumpists to keep expertise in the job. So I guess the question is, what's the message for the rest of the country? What's the what's the message for people looking for guidance here? Yeah, I think that it's easy to see some of this on the news and think that that's another place or that that's the fringe and it doesn't impact your life. But, but I can tell you every one of these elected officials in this community who, by the way, every one of them are Republicans, um, have faced an incredible onslaught of smears and lies and conspiracies um, over the last months to several years. I think this is a situation where in this county, Republicans and unaffiliateds and even some Democrats who, who switched just to vote in this race because they saw how important many of these offices were to their daily lives, it's gonna take everybody to address these issues. And it's hard. It makes life difficult for people who are doing already very difficult work. I never thought as the coroner, you know, I had to take on a pandemic and then immediately follow that up with like right-wing extremism. That really wasn't on my professional bucket list of what I thought I would have to deal with, but but that's where we live. And, and unfortunately, every job probably at this point is going to have to take that on. Dr. Leon Kelly, El Paso County, Colorado. Thanks, Doc. That does it for this edition of Breaking the Vote. When we're back, holding insurrectionists accountable, or not in some cases, nearly two years since the 2020 election. Greg Walters takes us behind the legal jeopardy the former president finds himself in after his unprecedented and multi-pronged attack against democratic norms. And Liz Landers takes us to Florida, where former felons are in a legal gray area as their once restored voting rights become complicated. Be sure to sign up for our weekly Breaking the Vote newsletter. It's at vice.com slash breaking the vote. And we'll see you next time. I'm Michael Learmonth, editor in chief of Vice News. Too often, traditional news outlets shy away from the real stories and experiences of those living through global conflicts not Vice News. Our reporters are on the ground, fearlessly covering the human stories that shape our world. You and millions of others can continue to read, watch, and listen to Vice News for free. But we hope you'll consider making a one-time or ongoing contribution of any size at vice.com slash contribute. Every contribution, no matter how big or small, helps support the journalism Vice News brings to you every day. Thank you.